honestly, at first, I didn't want to work on the passport of Malam Ilya, but, you know, I, we argued, we went back and forth, looking at other African stories. We had so many arguments talking about, you know, African literature from different authors as well. And, but something struck me about Passport of Malam Ilya, and that was the title for the book. What was my first reaction? I think my first reaction was no. I didn't want to do it. Yeah. I didn't want to do it. I, I felt um, we wanted to do an action play, you know, something. And I felt, why don't we just try something more subtle? That's what I wanted. I wanted something more subtle. I didn't want, I, I don't want sword slashing at people doing acrobatics and stuff. I, I wanted something, I don't, I don't know. I just, I, I just felt we should do something play. And then I read the book. And I realized I was, there's something here. There's a whole lot to explore, you know? There was a whole lot to explore. When I was invited to work in this project, I was, I was pretty excited because I, I love Supernuquency. I don't find the passport of mine in here particularly intriguing, like the rest of the stories that I've read. But when I was called upon to do this, because I've read the story, I know the story, I was, I was really excited about the prospect of turning this into an adaptation, an animation for that, and I was really excited about that. So I jumped on a nail and I like, look, I'm taking this as a personal project. I'm not turning my back until we see the end of it. So first, before we even visited Kano for the research, I had I've been you know looking up for some Arabic movies and looking out um, their culture because I know it's a bit synonymous to what we have with Alsa. So I'm uh, looking at a lot of movies. I don't want to mention names. Looking at a lot of movies for references and all that stuff. But we believe those those cultures. We actually I think using that same feel, having that same you know, Arabic stuff didn't really work too well. I, at a point, I, I got stuck and I felt that we really need to, This the, the importance of this research was actually to get things right and to get the outside culture right in terms of art field, what does the, um, what does the dressing looks like, what does the costume, what are the props and everything, their huts and, you know, their style of living basically, their culture, what does it look like, what does it feel like, and you can only get this feeling if you actually go to Kano and experience these things yourself, then come back with the, with the imagery and the mental picture, with pictures as well, from you know, these venues and these settings. So the, the idea was actually to go to Kano, have these things together, and you know, come back with a solid and concrete you know, description of what the Aosa, what Asian Kano really looks like. I wrote two drafts before going to Kano, and I still ah, change a lot. Okay, there, there is this particular elegance and flamboyance I give some characters that, that after seeing what the Kano people look like, I felt I had to tame. They were not like that. Well, the Kano experience was the icing on everything. I think what we set out to do to get up with the team was to relieve the experience related in that book. We need that to be there. We can't just sit down and write up cheer scripts and everything and plan our production from our own mindset and all of that. So we needed to see Kano. We needed to feel Kano. We needed to leave the story. We needed to sit where Ilya sat. We needed to walk around where he walked with his food so we could see that. So the Kano experience was what jailed everything. If we had not been to Kano, we wouldn't know how people in Kano looked like in those years that Ilya lived. We wouldn't even know the places where he lived. We wouldn't even know the dialect of how he spoke while he was alive. What this um, research has done for me is to expose me to the Hausa culture 
and those little little details you find here and there in in people in in um in 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 habits in mannerism of you know what the typical awesome man actually behaves like and you know those little little details really count and really help to shape my mind around what you know the look and feel would would be like for this movie there's not everything Equenti depicted in his book uh, I mean, it's not everything he depicted well in his book. There were just some things that he did not give details to, especially the the nature of the people around. So, you know, I, I was talking to you about sociology of the whole story and all of that. So the kind of people as depicted in the story did not uh, have all these things that we saw. I mean, there was no part of his story that he dedicated in talking about their nature who they were, how friendly they were, how mean they were, aside from his major characters. And then we understand that the story is not made up of just the major and the minor character. There are other people who are playing background roles, that their, that their relevance in the story is told in how you know, they, are, they are depicted. And so I found out that we have a lot of infusion to do of the actual nature of these people, how receptive they are, how very conservative, how cool and calm, collected, they are under tremendous pressure and all of that. He told me, write this story. And I was like, okay, I'm gonna write this, you know. Read the book, it started from that train scene and the whole thing just kept going down. And I, I, I could understand what was going there. Like, there was a team, there was something there, and I felt we could explore a whole lot. And immediately I picked it up, I read from, as I said, you know, from the very beginning to the end, this was adaptable. So when we arrived at um, Kano Railway Station, believe me, I was really fascinated by the view because I have never really been to a well-organized train station as such in Nigeria before. So we still have the subways and, you know, queue for passengers and all that stuff. And we have some train there. And we actually learned that those um, railways actually lead to um, Bauchi, Bornu and probably Kaduna, I think. So um, getting into the train itself actually brought me to the character of Hazan and also character of Ilya because being there with them and understanding the entirety of that trip, I understood at a point, I don't, I don't want to give any spoilers, but at a point I got to understand what Ilya actually felt like being in that train and the discomfort that Hazan actually felt, you know, in the first passage of the prologue, being in the train and all that stuff. So we stayed in the train, we saw, you know, the coatings, the leather coatings and what it looks like to be in this Asian train. We saw the engines and everything. We took snapshots of it. Believe me, it was awesome. So going from one cabin to the next and seeing, you know, the restroom, you know, just looking at it, it's just a sight to behold. Everything looks dusty, but trust me, we really had, I really had that mental picture. I really needed that mental picture at that point in time too really know what it's like to be in a Kano railway station. And I believe most of this story, I believe Cyprian himself has actually been into one of these trains, probably that particular train. I, all, all true, I, I felt, I felt Malam Ilya was was gently sighing. He was, yeah, that's what he did. All true, you know. And so, coupled with the whole train scene, I, I imagine the train there were not very fast. And I just saw this very, very tamed atmosphere, you know, where you, where you are a little bit. How will I put it now? It's very tamed, and you are not so happy. Tamed and grey. Yeah, that's the word I would use. It's tamed and grey, and that, that, that qualified Malamilia for me. What I find most intriguing, I know everybody will say the Sanchi fight, the Sanchi fight. Everybody is even excited to see Sanchi. You know, when you tell people about Passport of Manamilia, the first thing that gets them is the Sanchi fight. And for me, um, I'll say what, what really intrigued me about this story, coming from a personal point of view, was, you know, the day I met with 
the team, the day I met with Isaac and the day I met with Tocha, we actually sat down together to flesh out the story. Part of the thing that struck my mind was that day I had this bitterness in my mind because I have just messaged someone and we had a conversation and it triggered um, my temper. And looking back to this story, I got a sense of rage that I've never felt before and I'm like, whoa, how about, you know, animating this? What does it feel like? How, how about you want to make people feel what Ilya felt in this movie? If, if you've read the book, you'll know the story is about love. It's about vengeance. And these two teams carries all through to the end, okay? And what voice do you think would actually say that? I told you before, I said, um, I felt Malamelia had a sigh all through, you know, a gentle sigh, silently wishing he didn't do what he did. I think that was the voice you'd, you'd feel more, okay? So when he's going to talk about his love, you would feel how it blossomed, and then you see how sad it made him feel. And then when he's going to talk about vengeance, you would understand why he's even... Like, let me say sadder now. Yeah, you would understand why he's sadder now because he ate him, okay, he ate him deep. The thing I found most intriguing about the, the whole book is, is actually the story of Zara and Ilya himself. To me, it's not really a story of revenge. I don't see it from that angle. A lot of people see it as a story of vengeance. And when someone took something from you, you have to find a way of getting it back and all of that. Paying them back for what they did to you. But I found it as a love story, primarily. Uh, the extent to which someone can go for another person. I think when you talk about revenge, you have to love someone to that extent, to be willing to even die for that person. Because Ilya put his life on the line to make sure that he avenged Zara. Even though I'm not saying that revenge is something I want to advocate for anybody, but then the love story, the commitment between the two people, how much sacrifice they gave for each other, to be with each other, even in death, I think is something that intrigued me the most. I'm not really easily taken by love stories at that, but the story of how Zara and Ilya lived their life is a love story I really want to live through. I think we all suffer what he did suffer, you know? We all, we all get angry, we all chase vengeance, we want to hurt people, you know. All, all these things are, are, are things that make us make some decisions and we see our lives spiraling towards a whole different angle and it affects us. It, it takes us from where we were to where we are right now. And for me to say I felt my life earlier had a sigh almost all true was because he made some very, very intense decision that would affect him later on. In writing about the Sanchi, you know, that, 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 that was this, ah, boom, ah, no, 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 no. That, that, that's not the way the Sanchi went. It's actually more serious, more, intimate than that. I mean, the Sanchi game, according to Cipriani Quincy, was some kind of sport meant to, you know, in, it, it's done for the purpose of winning something, like a game. But then, during our conversations with a lot of people that we met in Kano, I came to understand that um, it's not just, it's not even particularly a sport for winning a trophy which was Zara in, in the case of Malayalia. But it's actually some kind of entertainment. And then it's more, much more bloody than he depicted. Yeah, it's a, form of, it's a form of entertainment because it's after harvest. When you eat well, you get a lot of harvest, then you express your joy. It's just like the other shero that they do shadi. After, it's all the same. I have never heard of the word shenchi. I don't know how he came about it, but okay. in I know it's called shadi. 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 Yes. But there's sometimes there could be other words for the same thing. Yeah. Like a different dialect or something, or some people may call it in a different way. It is because of the Islam 
this it involves magic and then Islam prohibited magic. Maybe even with the current situation or spiritual of the country, it is not even maybe the government may not even allow that practice to be continued. So that is why the practice is declined. But before in villages, during the ceremonies of hero and whatever, they will also do it at the same time. People will be watching. So it's something that has to do with objects to cut someone. Because you see blood. But I think I will understand because he had a target of people he was trying to reach. And so he didn't want to really confuse their, uh, their, their psyche with all the blood and everything. It's a blood spot. Blood. Because when they are doing it, you will see blood. Because they used to remove some part of human. Be it your finger, hand, ear. But then I came to understand Sanchi is a very bloody fight that has to do a lot with magic. Even those that they participated, you must have charm because you have to do something that you can protect yourself. It's all about depicting who is stronger in magic and all of that. So it's not really a spot uh, for winning something, but it's just a game of entertainment. I believe we will try to make it artistically suitable as much as possible. In terms of, um, we know that um, foreign cartoons, they try to put it at minimal you know, the idea for violence and, you know, they're very sensitive around showing blood and all that stuff. But I think we will try as much as possible to see how we can make it better and suitable for, you know, audience of different categories and age. And so I believe by the time we are done with this, it's something that even you can take your child to the cinema to watch. And even as adults, we can actually watch and get something from. But I, but I believe strongly in the African literature. African literature is supposed to be told the way it is. That's how stories came to us. Moonlight story came to us. It's supposed to be told the way it is. So we are not, we are not, I think the trueness of African literature is that we are not that sensitive to to violence, we tell it if the villains, are, if the protagonist at the end of the day dies in the story, he dies. If the villain wins at the end of the story, he wins. We don't try to fine tune it. That is the difference between African literature and Western literature. We tell it the way it is. So I think as much as possible, we are tapping back into the roots of African culture and telling Af African stories authentically and the way it's supposed to be. As much as it's fiction, I still want you to come close. Come close and see what it looks like. Sanchi is cool, man. I want to see the Sanchi fight, even though we are the guys that will be animating it as well. The Amy of Kano, visiting the Amy of Kano was, was, was an amazing experience because talking about royalty, talking about traditional institutions in the book, um, Ilya, Ilya was from, was royalty, he had royal blood. And then Usman was someone who, who, you know, who impersonated royalty. There was a lot of impersonation of royalty and all of that. And there was actual royalty because there were kings mentioned, very influential people mentioned. So we needed to see how these things are really are. So, so when we got to the palace, the Emir received us. That one-on-one -on -one interaction that we had, that, that tour around the palace, seeing how people dress in royalty, how they react to things, how they respond to people, how they even conduct themselves while sitting down and, and doing regular things as crossing their legs and all of that. So we saw all those details, those intricate details and everything just, just opened up right before our eyes and we saw everything. So meeting the Emmy of Kano was, was an icing as regard to royalty and the whole story and all of that.
I think you know in making an adaptation, the movie adaptation, there are little little details that we have to put together to actually flesh it all out. And part of those details are, you know, trying to explain what the um, you know the Kano administration before colonialism came into place, and you know during the reign of um, during the 14th century, the reign of um, Sakin Kano, Mohammed Ramfa, who actually um, was the guys that actually created that war, the wall of Kano and um, Seriki Jigimasu that made that wall of Kano possible. What was intriguing about the Kano wall? I mean, you wall, the whole of Kano was walled, okay? A thick fortification against any um, invaders. And that, 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 that's the mindset. That, that, that's, it, 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 there's a drive for, for you to want to do that. This is the city wall of Kano, and it was built by Seriki Jigimasu, I think in the 14th century, okay? And um, from what I got, this particular place we are standing was actually all flooded. There was water all these places, and um, this wall was built in such a way with this water here to prevent the enemies from entering. This wall actually goes round, like round the whole Kano. And but now most of these walls are now broken down. They are broken down for they, they, they've been broken down, but still this this one still remains and it's thick. It's thick. I mean, it's not just one tall lanky thing. It's actually wide, you know. And it's marvelous to see something standing. 14th century and we're still standing. Okay, it, it, it's mind-boggling. It's mind-boggling, you know. What, what what would drive you to want to do something that big, you know, at such huge scale and money possibly and time okay I, I think so many things got my attention in terms for art direction for the movie I think um, I, won't, I won't say anything to be precise like this major thing got my attention I think almost everything got my attention because I was when when we went to the die pit and we met with um, one of the founding fathers of the die pit who inherited it from his father as well he's really old and he's very known i've forgotten his name so he showed us like a die pit of like 100 pits and other stuff so he mentioned a tin color which was which came natural to them and that was um color blue this is the put the water normal water 1550 liters of the water 1,550 liters of the water. After I put the water, another put the ingredients. This is the three ingredients. Natural indigo plant, potassium chloride, and the ash. Potassium ash. Ash from the firewood. This is the put. The ash is 40 bucket mixed together into the feet. After I put the ash, another put the ingredient, potassium, uh, natural indigo plant, like henna. And I give him the color brown, indigo give him the color blue. This is a hundred kg mixed together. After put the natural indigo, you take the cover the basket. This basket. Cover the basket oh, no, 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 three days. Like After three days, you remove the basket, another put the ingredient, potassium chloride. Potassium chloride. I will put the potassium chloride in five bottles. After I put 
drug for potassium chloride live four days, four days plus three days, seven days, calculate. This is the fermentation period. Starting to make the color. This solution only giving the one color blue. No red, no ash and other color. One color blue for the print. Let blue taken in and out, remove in and out, taking 30 minutes. Let blue. Normal blue taking 45 minutes. Dark blue, one hour. Blue, black or navy blue, one hour, 30 minutes. And I even noticed that Yusuf Grillo, which is a very popular Alsa painter, uses color blue a whole lot. And I've always questioned myself, like, why has Yusuf Grillo always been using the color blue for most of his portraits? Because, you know, looking at this project, I have to give a lot of reference from Alsa artists and, you know, have those art backgrounds myself. I look at those things, so I like, okay, have that question myself. So I, like, nah, so I realized that probably he got those inspirations from the fabrics that they were being, they were, that was worn then. And, you know, those things inspired his, his use of color. And aside from, aside from the use of color and all that stuff, I got to understand that, you know, even from the calabash to the poetry and um, down to the props, and what the hunters wore, you know, the gunpowder, all these things have some specific designs. There's the symbols of the knot. I came to understand that there's the symbols of the knot and their patterns like Arewa and the rest of them. There's so many of them that, you know, I learned in this research that actually helped fuse in better structure and better stylized Aosa art to the Passport of Malamilia project. This museum is one of the ancient museums we are having here in the northern part of Nigeria. And the museum here was built in the year 1440. It was built by King Abdullah Ibruja. King Abdullah Ibruja built this palace. When he built this palace, he now stays there. It was the former Emir's Palace. This is the ancient Emir's Palace. And why does the new Emir's Palace? This is the first Emir's Palace, which was built in the year 1440 by King Abdullah Ibruja. When King Abdullah Ibruja built this palace, he now stays here. He has a grandson. His grandson's name is Mohammed Rofa. Mohammed Rofa was the last king that stayed there. And he now decided why not build a permanent Emir's Palace. That is why he decided to build a new permanent Emir's Palace there from 1471 to 1478. Let's go over there. This is a cannon gun. And this gun was used by the British forces. That was the first British Governor General, Lord Frederick Lugard. Lord Frederick Lugard came to Kano in 1903. When he came, the canoe has a seat wall and no how you can come into canoe except through the gate. He now used the force to use this canoe. Cano. This canoe is 75 meter long range. When he used the canoe, he bombed one of the gates in canoe. And the name of that gate is Kofar Kabuga. The name of that gate is Kofar Kabuga. After destroying the gate, he now gets access to canoe. This is the canoe which was used by the first British Governor General. Lord Frederick Lugard, the 75 meter long range cannon. Let's go over, get over there to see the short range. Just like the way I told you about that 75 meter long range, this is the short cannon which was used by the British forces in 1903. Look at it. They used to they normally put the bomb inside, there is a hole here, they scratch the matches. You know they can't use they can't carry it. It's very heavy. It has a tire. They used to push it in different direction and set it in a different direction. Look at how it was. These are some of the Asian forts, which are normally kept beside of the gates. And this port, some of them are over 300 years. They used to fill it with water, because when the visitors are coming, they will be getting water to drink. You know, the canoe has a sea tool, and know how you can come into a canoe except through the gate. They used to put this port beside of the gate, because when the visitors come, they will be getting to water to drink. And the port over here you are seeing is over 300 years. These are the ancient walls, which was used with almost four to five materials. 
the brick stone, when we go inside, I will show you the block, the red clay, the local seat bag, and the local seat. The side the, here we see this is a painting. They used to use the local seat bag to paint the wall. Look at how it was. Whenever the rain fell, whenever the rain fell, the place here to be darker than this. And the rain can never wash it. Because why? Because of the local seat bag. The local seat bag has a gum on it. You can never wash it. And whenever the rain falls, the place will be darker than this. Look at it very well. Look at the material. And this design you are seeing here, they use, they use the hand here to design it. You see? Then design the wall, then design the wall. When the wind is falling, it will not enter inside. It will not be touching it. Tipping the side and be falling down. It will make the place be very, very strong. Look how the wall is. And now we are going inside to show you the materials used for the building. These are the brick stones which was used to build this kind of building and look at the way they arrange it. This is the way they arrange it. Why these are also the materials. The way they arrange it here and why these are the materials. The materials are the they call it jankasa, clay mud, Bagarua, Kabi, that's the ash, local seed bark, the goat skin hair, and the, the door. This is the local seed, they call it Norawa. These are the mixtures, these are all the material used for the plastering on the wall and the building of the places. Okay. So, 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 you see, this one, this is called from Gadangaya. The way you are seeing, this is our right gate, go from Naisa. We go from Gadangaya, we go from Naisa here, before going to the go from Kabuga. These are the go from Kabuga. And these gates are over far from Reyes. When you look at it very well, there is some gunshot on it. All these ones are a whole of gunshots. You see? Yeah. Because when the British came, they start off shooting the gate. They shoot the gate, come to this gate, also shoot the gate here. You see, all here are gunshot. The gate did not open. That is when they use the cannon gun. Using cannon gun to destroy the gate. After destroying the gate, they now enter cannon and open it. You see? Open Kabuga, it was the gate through which the British military force entered cannon in 1903. Look at it very well. I had a very good view of it. Aside from what we saw with our eyes lying around and uh, the visit to the museum and all these places, we, we thought it was necessary to actually go to the and read about books that have symbols and images that talks about the, the, the culture of the Alsa, the culture of the Northern people. So I, I, we went to Bayero University, Kano, and we we went to their library. We met with the linguistic and foreign affair um, dean, and we spoke to him. He gave us insights about the culture of the North, and you know some some tips here and there. We actually read books that addressed you know the art forms, the art forms of the North, what their poetry look like, and you know what the um, the art styles look like. What are the what are the sculptural pieces, knock arts? What did they look like then? And you know, who, who made these things and how did they work? So, you know, putting all those little, little details together, we just have to figure out, okay, from their poetry to the literature and everything fused in together, it, it help you understand the symbols of the knot. I think uh, we did a whole lot trying to understand the symbols of the knot because, you know, they still had the same calabash, they still had the same stuff. But they, they feel the, the, this whole thing with symbols and stuff. So I believe even also have a texture to them. They have a texture. They have a color. There's a way. There's a way their color texture should feel like. And you know, reading books and reading, going to the library, actually helped shape my mindset towards these things. We're asking questions. I, I think 
I think the historian that put us through all these things, put us through, you know, the culture of the North, gave us books to read as well that explained, you know, what the Tuaregs actually wore, you know, their shield, what their shield actually looked like. So I saw I saw these images, what the shield of the Tuaregs actually looks like, and what um, the Tuaregs ladies, what they wore, and the neck piece they had on, and those details, those details, you don't get them. You don't find them cheaply. You don't find them by looking around. So I think it was really good that we had to go to the library and read about these things ourselves, look at books, and look at what history says about them too. Well, we're actually in, when we went to Kano, we discovered that some of those moat buildings that we wanted, the, the kind of architectural design in the days of Ilya, a lot of them were no longer standing. Even the Kano wall, about 70% of the wall is, is, is down. About 70% of the wall has been broken down by people and it's no longer standing as that that impregnable edifice and all of that. But then we discovered that a lot of those buildings are not in existence. Even some of those places that house the very rural things we set out to look for are no longer there. But then we had to go to other places very deep into Kano rural communities to find out some of those things. But Cyprian Equency actually did, did some things I would give him credit for in how he depicted their buildings and everything. But he didn't give everything. I, I wouldn't even rate him 70%, but he did his best. But then we saw everything that we came looking for, and I think we're going to give a fantastic depiction of that in our, in our work. The team, the team we work on this, I think the team is capable of taking on any production not just the passport of Mala Ilya, because this is a group of people who are committed to doing what they're doing. And it's a group of people who are, uh, are bent on achieving the end result, regardless of what is achievable. The sacrifice is there, the commitment is there, the patience, the tenacity, the creative intelligence. So I think this team has everything it takes to pull out a, a very wonderful production.